So in a previous video of Weld.com, we, we did a D11 3G plate. We're going to go ahead and run 4G today. For those of you that don't know, 4G is just an overhead groove weld. So we're going to go ahead and get into some of the specifics as far as settings, parameters, travel angle, work angle. If you guys aren't familiar with this setup, go back and watch the D11 3G video and we talk about the, uh, the plate and how to set that up. But we're going to go same basic settings as we did last time, 22 and a half degree bevel on each plate for a 45 degree included angle, meaning those two angles added up together. We have a 45 degree groove in here. I have a quarter inch root opening, which is about where I like it, quarter inch to 5 16 so I went ahead and tacked the, uh, the top and bottom of this plate as well as the back side to keep it from drawing a little bit. We're gonna use this nifty little stand from Triangle Engineering, uh, so I don't need to put any uh, strong backs on here. For those of you that don't know what strong backs are, it's just another piece of material on here that keeps that plate from rolling up like a banana as we weld on it because the more heat input we put into here, uh, the more of this it's going to want to move the metal. So anytime you put heat on metal, it's, it's going to want to move it towards the direction of that heat. But thanks to this stand right here, we don't have to do that. We're going to have constant pressure on the back side. So we'll go through the, the route, the inner passes, and then show you guys how to go to cap. So let's go ahead and check out the settings. All right, so today we're going to use the ESOB EMP 235IC. We're going to go ahead and go to the stick mode. And I'm just going to go up here and change some of these parameters uh, to what I like. I'm going to go, um, you have your choice between 6010 or 6011 or all other electrodes. We're going to use 7018. So all other electrodes go over here. So this is our hot start. I like to keep my hot start around 50 to 75%. Um, that's just going to give me a, a little bit better arc initiation, especially for those of you that have welded overhead before. You know that the arc can kind of be a little bit stubborn on the ignition. So I'm going to go ahead and get that set up to 50% uh, here. And then we'll go over here to my arc force. Arc force is like that, that digging nature. What this it does, it's going to help me prevent, uh, it's going to help prevent me from sticking. So because in the overhead position, that puddle tends to try to cap over top of that electrode because I keep a really tight arc length. This is, the machine's going to know that and it's going to increase my amperage just a little bit and provide me um, a little bit more oomph as I'm going through a little bit more dig action. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run about 120 amps. So typically in the flat position, I like to run 125 amps. So I'm just going to bump that back just a little bit for overhead. You can do about 5%, which will put you around 116, 118. I'm going to go ahead and run it at 120. Anywhere within that range, uh, you should be, should be just fine doing it. I've passed tests. Uh, at anywhere from 115 to 125, right around 120 is where I like it though. And then we're going to switch our output over to on uh, when we get ready to weld. Make sure that we're running DC reverse polarity, okay? So that means my electrode holder or stinger is going to be connected to the positive terminal and then my workpiece clamp or ground clamp is going to be connected to the negative side. This is called DC reverse polarity or electrode positive, right, or DC plus. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so before we get into it, I'm just gonna go over some of the techniques I'm gonna be utilizing. Um, so basically, I like to get the weight off my dominant hand. Whatever hand is gonna be controlling the electrode, uh, I like to keep the weight off of that. So I'll just kind of loop some of the uh, cable in my hand and get this up out of the way, right? So now this hand's kind of free to move about the cabin. Uh, when I get up in here, I'm just gonna strike at the run-on tab, just like we did in the, the, uh, the 3G video, and I'm gonna utilize that to my advantage. I'm going to strike there, make sure my puddle's going nice and hot, and then I'm going to work myself into that groove. As I get into the groove, I'm just going to watch the edges of the puddle, make sure it ties into all three plates, meaning uh, the, the, both plates as well as my backing strip. I'm going to burn up in there, keep a nice tight arc gap, and just watch it. And very similar to welding flat, guys. So if you're welding flat, you got a 5 to 10 degree travel angle. Same thing overhead, 5 to 10 degree travel angle. This essentially is just an upside down flat. You know, a lot of people get in their head that it's overhead, they freak out, it's gonna be difficult. It's not much different than flat. Uh, if you can weld flat, you can weld overhead. It just takes a little bit more getting used to. Keep that tight arc gap in there. I'm probably just gonna bounce from side to side, not really a weave, just a little bit more of a manipulation to make sure that that puddle's going exactly where I want it to. Watching the edges of my puddles because that's gonna be the toes of my weld once it's solidified. Uh, we'll go through and then I'll show you guys how to do a, a start and stop probably about halfway, three quarters through the plate. We'll go ahead and do a tie-in right there, and then we'll complete that, and then we'll go ahead and do the following passes. All right, so I got that one terminated about, I don't know, a little over halfway, not quite three quarters. 
I'll go ahead and clean this out and get rid of any slag that's in here. I want to do that before I put my other pass in there because I don't want to trap any slag. So I want to make sure this is as clean as possible before I proceed. All right, so we got it all cleaned up. So I'm basically, I'm just going to go through here, make sure that I don't have any well discontinuities and there's no point starting, you know, continuing on with the test if I have <clears throat> lack of fusion or heavy porosity or anything like that. So I want to make sure that I don't have any of those discontinuities in here. It looks like I don't. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and we'll start with the restart or the tie-in. So same thing, I'm going to start about <clears throat> half inch, or I'm sorry, about a quarter inch to three eighths in front of the crater where I left off. I'm going to strike back into it, tie in and just pick up like I never stopped. Now you'll notice I'm staying center in that joint, but a five to 10 degree pull angle as I'm, as I'm dragging this, or dragging the, uh, the weld down through the plate, down through the groove. Okay, so I'm just making sure that the puddle is tying into the corner of the bevels of these plates. We've got a knife head set up on there. They're really thin, so all I have to do is just bump into them, and then I know that they're tying in. I'm going to go ahead and utilize this runoff tab. That's what it's there for. You don't have to make use of the whole thing, but I'm going to come out at least an inch, inch and a quarter. Everybody here should be good. So I'm going to let that cool down. I don't want to start beating on this thing while it's still red hot because then I'm going to start putting tooling marks in the weld up underneath that slag. So it's a good habit to get into to where you're not beating on it while it's still glowing red. Um, that way you're not leaving tooling marks behind because that's another thing you can get uh, disqualified for excessive tooling marks on your plate. You don't want that. You don't want that in your welding area. So keep that in mind. Just get this stuff out of the way. We'll hit it up with a wire brush really quick. Same thing. Go through with a little flashlight, clean everything out. So again, we're not going to use any, uh, any power tools. Everything's going to be handheld. So I've got a regular Regular chip and hammer, no pneumatic needle scale or anything like that. Just regular chip and hammer, regular wire brush. Um, D11 doesn't say you can't use power tools during the test, but D15 does. If you can weld a D15 standards, you're going to be able to weld the D11. Uh, they're pretty similar for the most part, but you shouldn't need any power tools to do any of this. Just regular hand tools. Again, go through, check on your restart, your tie-in. Tie-in looks... A lot better than it did in my last video. Don't have any lack of fusion. Don't have any incomplete fusion. Don't have any pinholes, porosity, none of that stuff. Everything's nice and even. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run two passes. Okay, the first pass is going to be on my left hand side with my right hand. So I'm going to point up this way and I'm going to tie this part in right here. And I'm going to cover up 50% of that root and I'm going to tie the other 50% of that weld into the face of this plate. Okay, once I get done with that one, I'll go ahead and do the other side and then we'll see where we are from there. But this second layer is going to consist of two weld passes. That's just, just looking at it. Uh, I probably could run a little bit wider of a stringer in here, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and shoot for that, that two stringer in or, or, or that two stringer pass. Now, as I'm going through on this second pass here, I want to make sure that I don't get too far over to the right hand side. If I get too far over there, I'm gonna leave myself a really deep valley to try and fill in on my next pass and that weld may not penetrate all, to the, all the way to the bottom. So I wanna stay, you know, just halfway covering up that root. If I go any further, I could make a, an unpleasurable experience for my next pass, make it a little bit more difficult on myself. You wanna make sure you got all the slag off both ends of your run-in and run-off tabs. I tell people it's like uh, stepping in dog crap and then walking through your white, you know, walking through your house. You don't want to do that. So clean up any slag or you know anything you got out here because you don't want to pull that into your welding zone with you. Just gonna go ahead and use one of these weld stubs when I tack everything together. Just kind of knock some of that that flux off the side, so I've got a bare wire, and it should allow me to do a good good restart. Again, utilize my runoff tab. That's what it's there for. A lot of this stuff will just fall off. You just got to give it a little bit of convincing in a couple small areas. 
All right, so same methodology, same technique, except for this time I'm gonna point upwards to the right-hand side. I wanna tie, I wanna tie this right-hand plate in, so I'm just gonna point that way. So if, if I was going straight up and down, probably about five to 10 degrees, you know, aiming to the right, five to 10 degree tilt angle or drag angle. Um, we'll go ahead and lay the second pass in. What I'm trying to do is get everything nice and flat, and then I can probably go to cap after this pass. We'll give it a shot. Same thing, let it cool. I have to do a tie-in. I got about inch and a inch and a quarter, inch and three eighths plate left. One thing you don't want to do is rush it. Let it take the amount of metal that it needs. All right, so I'm gonna let this cool down for a minute before I go to cap. Um, it's kind of getting a little warm right now. If I keep welding on it while it's too hot, it's gonna be harder to control that puddle. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it a couple minutes to cool down. But in the meantime, we're gonna go ahead and do a giveaway. We're gonna send out a pair of these Cayman 1450s to the winner. Um, all you have to do to enter is go down into the comment section. So hit pause, run down to the comment section. And since we're doing this to AWS D11 standards, go ahead and tell us what year AWS was founded. Post it up in the comment section. We'll pick a random winner, and then we'll send you out a pair of gloves. All right, stay tuned for the cap. All right, so everything's cooled down for the most part. It's about, you know, it's pretty decent, not too hot. I'm gonna go ahead and run the cap, and I'm gonna do that the same way I put in pass number two. Basically, I'm just gonna point right up in here. I wanna make sure that about an eighth inch comes over the, the leading edge of this plate. That way I can tie in over here. Uh, the remaining portion of the weld's gonna be down here in this area. What I need to do is I want to make sure that I'm at least flush and no higher than one eighth of an inch. Overhead typically lays in pretty flat, so I don't think I have anything to worry about. Uh, I'm just gonna run this just like I did the rest of the passage. Just nice, slow, steady pull, and just watch the edges of the puddle and bring it all the way through. Start on the run on tab, finish up on the run off tab. If I have to do a restart in the middle or wherever it happens, uh, we'll go ahead and do it. All right, so that last rod I probably burned down just a little bit more than I should have, uh, but I terminated right where I needed to anyway. I'm outside of the welding joint, almost on the, uh, the runoff tab, so that shouldn't give me any low spots. Just judging at it from the side, I'm at least above flush, so that's really all that I'm worried about. As long as I'm not over an eighth inch, we're still good to go. We'll get it cleaned up, and then we'll just keep putting the, uh, the cover passes on. So now this next pass, I'm gonna fire it off right here. All right, so I'm gonna start a little bit further on my run-on tab. Because this is the last, this is the last uh, row of passes here. I just wanna make sure the left-hand side of my puddle is tying into that previous weld, that first pass. About 50%. Basically riding the toe of the previous weld and splitting the difference. 50% coverage on the weld, 50% inside the welding area. Just watching the toes. Just 
trying to keep a nice even travel speed. Stay consistent, nice tight arc gap. If, it, if the gap gets too long, you can end up get porosity in there because you don't have the appropriate shielding in there. So make sure you keep a nice tight arc gap. Push it right up against the material. It's almost like welding by braille. You can feel that rod getting shorter. Just keep pushing it up in there. Give it a good wire brush. Check it with the light. Make sure there's nothing we need to pay attention to or address while we're running this next pass. And we'll get back into it. Get in there with a the flashlight. Check everything out. I almost missed a piece of slag. It's good, you know, pulled out the flashlight, went back through it, made sure I got everything. You don't want to trap slag in here. I mean, that'll that'll bust you out on a uh, a bend, and they'll definitely spot it in an X-ray. All right, so I've got just enough area in here. I'm just going to run a little bit wider of a stringer than I typically run uh, versus trying to split two passes on here or running a really wide weave. I should be able to fill this little groove in here and come up flush. Just over flush is where I like to be. Now, I don't like to gamble on it. Same thing, I'm going to fire off on the run-on tab. Just ease into the welding zone. So I don't have much of a uh, angle pointed up towards the previous weld. Maybe about five degrees. Because I want to make sure that I tie into the top edge of my right hand plate. That's a big thing as well. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that both of these passes are tied in. Got to get it into the previous weld without having any low spots. As well as as well as that right hand side of that plate. So I'm using that edge of that plate just kind of as a visual guide. As long as I see that eroding away and getting covered up with weld metal, I know I'm hitting my intended target. That's a little bit wider of a pass. I anticipate a start and stop at some point. Most likely closer to the end. I'm going to go ahead and terminate it early though. Kind of stop on my own terms. Don't want the rod to tell me when I have to stop. A lot of people freak out. That rod starts getting short. Stop on your own terms. Don't let that rod tell you what to do. Right? You're running the rod, not the other way around. So I'm about a quarter, three eighths above or in front of it. Come right back down to where I left off. Still watching that right hand edge and the previous weld on the left hand side. You don't need to go excessively wide on this. Just need to get that edge to erode away and fill it in with weld metal. You can do little circles. I'm just kind of bouncing off side to side. Go ahead and fill this end in here a little bit. That way there's no question. And that is it. We'll go ahead and get her cleaned up. Get the cameraman and zoom in there a little bit. See what we got. All right, guys, so that's it. The AWS D1.1 Shielded Metal Arc Welding 4G or overhead uh, pre-qualified test. So weld is above flush, less than an eighth of an inch. Tie-in's pretty decent. Uh, not my best work, but, you know, we could all use a little bit of practice. No undercut, no excessive reinforcement. The, uh, throughout the entire six-inch piece of the plate, everything is uh, right about where I need it to be. So... If you guys have any questions on how to do this procedure or process or anything like that, go ahead and drop the comments down in the section below. I'll be more than happy to help you out. Uh, if you have any questions about anything in, related to welding, uh, go ahead and post them up in there as well. Don't forget about the contest for the Cayman gloves. Uh, tell us what year AWS was founded. Um, and I think that's about it, guys. So we appreciate you liking and subscribing our videos. Without you guys, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. I, I, you know, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. So, you know, hopefully we can continue to make great content for you. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, sign up for the HelpMeWeld.com section on the Facebook page or the Facebook group or our Instagram page. And until next time, make every weld better than your last. Hey, guys, welcome back to another episode of HelpMeWeld.com. Today's submission comes from Philip Hawk in the Facebook group. He wants to know, how does everyone, to, how does everyone prefer to clean TIG filler rods before use with all materials? Um, I would say depending on, you know, you could probably get away with wiping it down with a acetone, just a quick, you know, damp a cloth with some acetone, um, wipe it down with that. Uh, for aluminum, I tend to take a little bit more 
of an in-depth approach. I mean, as you can see here, I have what looks to be a relatively clean piece of 4043 aluminum. However, you know, if you just barehanded wipe your hand down, you can see that I've just pulled a bunch of crap off of it. Uh, however, if I hit this with a piece of Scotch-Brite and wipe down with some acetone, I'll get rid of that surface contaminant. You ever notice when you, you're welding along and you get like these little black peppered marks or flakes as you're welding along with your aluminum? It's because you have surface contaminants on your filler metal. I mean, you may have prepped your, your base metal relatively clean, but you have to remember, aluminum filler rod also has aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide melts around 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit while your base metal aluminum is going to melt around 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So after 24 hours, that aluminum oxide is going to regrow all over this again and you can cause small bits of contamination in your weld. Does it matter if you're practicing at the house? No. Building a, a gate for the neighbor? No. Uh, but when you start getting into structural applications with aluminum or you know code work or things like that, Nuclear plants, I mean, you're going to want to clean your filler metal. Uh, I always like to take as much preparation as I can to ensure that I'm going to get a good weld out of what I'm going to be working on. I mean, what's it going to take? An extra five seconds. So that's pretty much how I clean mine. Um, 70 series or 308, anything like that for steel or stainless. Uh, probably the same thing, you know, just quick wipe down with, the, with some acetone or whatever, especially if it's been sitting out in the shop environments. You got grinding dust and stuff going on. Um, your best bet is to keep everything inside of a tube to where particulates and, and matter from grinding and cutting and stuff like that aren't going to land on them. And that's just going to, you know, give you one less step you have to take when, uh, when you're prepping your base metals and your filler metals. So I hope that helps. Guys, if you have any questions uh, you want answered, go ahead and post them up in the Facebook page or the Facebook group on uh, theweld.com. And until next time, make every weld better than your last.